Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of the Wolfram Student Podcast. I'm Sam. And I'm Rashank. And we're your hosts. This is the Wolfram Student Podcast, where every fortnight we dive into a new innovative project done by high schoolers using the Wolfram language. And for our first episode, let's welcome Yana, who will be talking about her project on interesting behavior in 4D cellular automata. Hello, Yana. Hello. Hey, Sam. Hey, Rashank. It's awesome to have you here. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, for sure. So my name is Yana. I'm an incoming undergrad. I'm going to be studying, I think, computer science and math. So I'm really looking forward to that. Cool. Uh, where are you studying? I am going to go to Swarthmore College. It's close to Philadelphia. Sounds awesome. I guess let's hear a little bit about your history with Wolfram. Um, what camps did you attend and so on? I attended two camps, one in the summer of 2020 and then 2021. I was also a part of WELL, Wolfram Emerging Leaders Program, where I worked on a computational project with my amazing team. So Sam, you were there. Our AI was played toe in 2048 so well. Uh, yeah, highly recommend. I was also a ATA this year at camp. Sounds awesome. What was it like being a TA compared to having been a student for two years? Yeah, I mean, it was it was really fun. It was much more laid back because I didn't have like the responsibility of creating and publishing my own project. But at the same time, I really enjoyed just guiding people and helping everyone out with like small snippets of their project. So it was a lot more involved and I got to just see a ton more cool projects that they were working on and that they needed help with. So I really enjoyed being a TA. Yeah. And nice. we also had a ton of cool social activities that TAs were responsible for. So oh, I remember that. Everyone got yeah. to know each other better. Yeah. Scribble. This year we had an edition of Just Dance that was awesome too. Yeah. Sounds pretty cool. And to round out the intro, what's your favorite word from language function? My favorite Wolfram function, as as you can see from the project I'm going to be talking about today, has to be the cellular automata function to generate all the cool cellular automata. That's certainly appropriate. Uh, so now going back to your actual project, finding interesting behavior in 4D cellular automata. Uh, so first off, why don't you tell us uh, a general summary of what your project is? Yeah, of course. Okay. So the first part, so okay, when I was choosing the project, there were two separate projects available with one dealing with visualizing 4D objects and the other one was cellular automata. I think that one was in 3D. But what was cool was that we combined these two projects for into one project, which is um, like exploring 4D cellular automata. So my project had two parts. The first part was visualizing it in a nice coherent way and yeah it was like a more of a computational art um, part and then the second part it was like um, an extension of the project I wanted to measure the fractal dimension dimension of the cellular automata so to find out if the hyper object was more regular or irregular and yeah. Mm, that's quite interesting. Uh, and this is a pretty advanced topic. So just for some background for our listeners, what exactly are cellular automata? I got you. So cellular automata is really cool. Um, it's where you have these simple rules that create complex patterns. And then the rules are based off a cell's neighbors. So over here, you have a triangle. And this is a 1D star atomic. So you start off with one black cell, typically. You don't have middle of surrounded by white cells. So this is in 1D. It's you have two neighbors. Each each cell has two neighbors. And then you use this rule. So you can hear see it, which is simple. So for example, three black cells, this the center one turns into a white cell. So you have black, white, black, the 
center cell remains white, and so on. And so you just apply these rules to each each row and you get this really cool visual, yeah. And there's a ton of applications for this. You can also extend it to 2D, where now instead you have one black cell in the middle of a 2D array. And again, you apply a rule to it so that it makes this really cool pattern in 2D. Same with Oops. 3D, except now you have a cube in the middle. And yeah. That looks really, really amazing. Your 2D cellular automata looked really similar to Conway's Game of Life. Is it the same thing? Yes, exactly. I mean, it's not, you could of course make a rule for that. So this, there's a ton of options. You can have a specified rule, like 30, 100 or something. You can make your own rule. So if a neighbor has three cells that are alive, it dies, five cells, it lives or something like that, which is Conway's game of life. So definitely you can do that here. Awesome. Going back to your main project, let's dive into some 4D. Okay. So yeah. like in 4D, you have four axes, the X, Y, and Z, and then another one, the W axis. So apparently they're all supposed to be perpendicular to, to each other, which is just really hard to think about. And Certainly, that's, yeah. that's a mind bending sort of shape. I, I can't picture it in my mind. And you can't call it a cube too, which was, that was like my initial, because it's not a cube. It has however many sides, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. But sure, wow, that yeah. seems insane. Yeah. So my, my thought process was for 3D cell automata, it's made out of 2D layers and then you stack them and then you get your 3D cell automata. So for 4D, same thing, except now the 4D is made out of 3D cubes. So 3D arrays. So that was my first thought process of just working with the 3D cube components of the 4D cell automata. Okay, um, I'm following that, that makes sense. Awesome, yeah. So yeah, you just, you pick a rule, you split it up into cubes. Can you explain your code behind how you visualize 4D using 3D? Yeah, okay, chill. So I used my favorite cellular automaton function to generate a 4D array. And then I split up the 4D array into 3D cubes. Chill. Okay. And yeah, I noticed that this is another mind bog. I'm not sure if it's like obvious or not, but the cubes, if you line them up from start to end, palindrome, they're identical. So the only unique cube is whoa middle. i know whoa if i know that's, that's that's really cool i see how they all match up i know i think you, you should probably we should probably try this with 3d star automata actually breaking it up into the 2d arrays see if those 2d arrays are also symmetrical would it be i don't know okay yes definitely so. sounds like a fun project <laughs> yes uh yeah so I deleted the half that were the same because for visualization, I didn't need to like have duplicates. And yeah, so I am very thankful that when I attended camp, they had a, they released a new version with a function called ArrayPlot3D. So you can plot a cube and specify the color, opacity, hue, opacity, yeah, everything. So what I did, was I took the cubes, I assigned each of them an ind individual um, opacity and a hue, depending on where they were in the 40 array. So over here, if you can see, I have like 10 cubes out of however many, because I removed the duplicates, so yeah. And then after splitting them up and making them all individual, I use the show function, which just basically combines all of the objects together. So I combined all the 3D cube components into one object. And because they had different cues, you were able to see most of them. Or, yeah, most of them. And of course, okay. 
So you can always change the opacity so you can see all of them. So let me just make sure I'm understanding this right. So instead of, because there was no way to directly visualize 4D, you broke it up into 3D components. And then for each 3D component, excluding the duplicates, you assign each one a unique color and then shove them all together to create a 4D array. To create a 3D array. Okay, oh, I was okay. doing my best to um, just, just find patterns in this, yes. Okay, yeah. Now that you mentioned it, yeah, of course, the one, another idea when I was still like brainstorming was somehow creating a 4D space. So when you rotate the 4D space, you see the th different 3D parts of the 4D star automata. Yes. So it would be something like a rate plot 40. But uh, I wasn't really sure how to do that yet in the Wolfram language. So I decided another approach would be to look at the components of the 40 star automata and then go from there. Okay, yeah. Still seems mm -hmm. really insane, but wicked. Yes. Yeah, so what did your final for future work? Just creating a 40 space. Gotcha. Uh, so what did the final visualization look like? We just call it a representative of 40 star automata. <laughs> yeah, that so is... um That's... here's one of them. That looks amazing, I'll be honest. That was yes. wow was one of my favorites. Yeah, well, that looks mesmerizing. If you stare at it, it's like, you could probably pretend it's kind of 4D because it turns into like an upside down trapezoid if you stare at it long enough somehow. Wow. And then you can just imagine um, that there are four axes. <laughs> definitely, that is, that is, you can also see like kind of symmetry in all the colors and everything lining up. So that's that's yeah, definitely. really amazing. Which the symmetry, that's really interesting because if you look at one D star Tom, then not all of them are symmetrical. But this looks pretty symmetrical. That Absolutely. is definitely a project, yes. Yeah. Uh, so what did you do once you had this visualization? Okay, so yeah, after I was, I had the idea and I could visualize kind of a 4D cube, <laughs> not hypercube, but a cube. Here's a more basic one with only like um, five iterations. So I decided to visualize the progression of one 4D cellular automata. And it's floating right now. But basically you start from like one cube which is yeah in this cell in the middle and then you go from there but now it's like just it's a combination of cubes from the 40 star atomic hmm. what strikes me is that even this basic one looks incredibly complex uh, like there's so much going on true it makes you think what you could do with it but it's definitely there for computational just to admire it definitely yeah progression of one of them. So it gets more and more um, complex as of course the amount of neighbors grow or die. This is a very cool one, like the final one. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, for just one, so our automata. And then I also created a manipulant where you could change the rule number, the amount of iterations, and then out of those iterations, you can pick the iteration number. Also, because once the iterations get to a certain point, there are so many cubes, you can rotate through them to see them like, so that the show function shows them in a different order. So you can see, you can, you can view through more cube components. And you can also, um, in the manipulate, change the opacity intensity, just so that if you want to, you can see all of them. Or if you only want to focus on like three or something, you can you can increase the opacity intensity as well. That is really amazing. So 
yeah. what about your interactive one? How did that work? Interactive one? Yeah. So you can just, all right. I've, I think that just changing the rule itself is the most interactive part. So this one's not as interesting. There's a ton of green up here. So this is where the rotate part comes in. You can rotate the cubes in a different order to try to push the green into the back so that the different cube components get shown first. Wow. OK, is... this is slightly better, kind of. It looks like it looks kind of like a game, like a Minecraft or something. It Just does. That is games. really amazing. Okay, let me try to find a cooler one. OK, this one's cool, too, honestly. I like how you can see the symmetry as it like develops, but it's kind yeah, of amazing to see to like see how just like a few rules can make these really symmetrical but still really amazing shapes. That is yes. fascinating. And then you don't know what to expect. Like you see the rule, but you can't predict what's going to happen, you know? Like you have to just run through all the iterations to see the final one. Cool. You also mentioned the second part of your project related to fractal dimensions. How was that all about? Yeah, so after I created some computational art, this was an extension of the project because I had more time. So I looked at whether the 4D shape, hyper shape, was more regular or irregular. Yeah. And yeah, so how, how exactly did you plan to measure the regularity, I suppose, of these hyper shapes? Yes. So you measure the volume of the hypercube starting from the center, so for different radii. So you just extend from the center outwards, counting the, the volume or area. I'm not sure what volume in 4D would be, but you counted the amount of cubes from the center. And then after that, you plot the losses to see the change in those volumes. That's a very creative way of thinking about it. Instead of trying to visualize a 4D, you just took patterns from 1, 2, and 3D and then apply them to 4D. That is, that's really cool. Yeah. So like for 4D, it just, I was actually able to count all eight neighbors. So it was like extending in 4D. This, this was easy because there are different ways you can count the amount of neighbors still has. I used the von Neumann neighborhood which is just counting the perpendicular neighbors from the center cell. So for 1D, that's each cell has two neighbors, left and right, 2D, top, bottom, left, right, four. So a cube has six perpendicular neighbors, so a 4D hypershape would have eight. So I started from the center, I checked all eight neighbors, counted up if the cells were alive or not, and if they were alive, that was included in the 4D volume. And then it was like a recursive function. So I just checked all the live cells neighbors after that. So like moving outwards and just counting up the 40 volume. Yeah. That's, a, that's really creative. Uh, so what did you find out in the end? Yeah, instead of using specific rules, I used growth cases, which is another option in the cellular dominant function. So you specify the cases in which it becomes. So whether it has one neighbor, two neighbors, three or four neighbors. So I found out here, you can see some of the graphs. So if it has low growth cases, it has a pretty variable change in volume for each radii. And so the fractal dimension is low. But if you look at the cellular automata with more growth cases, such as one, two, three, and four, it has a pretty steady um, fractal dimension, so it doesn't change as often when you move from the center. So that means you can assume that if a cellular automata has more growth cases, that means it's the growth is more regular. So it's growing, growing, growing into like a hypercube or a hypersphere. And so based on this pattern, you can assume that if it has a high average fractal dimension, it's more likely to be a regular hypershape, such as a cube or sphere. But if it has a lower fractal dimension, 
with um, fewer growth cases, meaning it's more variable. That means it's more likely to be an irregular 4D hypershape group. So wow. here I have a graph with all of them. That, mm -hmm. That's really cool. Uh, so you can use growth cases to measure how complex um, or how regular, I suppose, a 4D hypershape is. Yeah, I mean, growth cases is like specifying the cellular automata, it's like building it. And then you can use, um, it's called log differences to plot the differences in the 4D volume. Okay, uh, so I suppose out of this entire project, what was your favorite part? Mm, I feel like, okay, definitely manipulate because you could just cycle through all the rules and just admire the computational art. Yes, that was definitely and... very amazing to look at. <laughs> For sure, yeah. And I guess another part was just, I don't know, it's really satisfying to see these fractal dimension line plots. Yeah. yeah just. It, I guess the visualizations uh -huh. from this yeah. project were definitely very interesting to take a look at. But um, I guess since the visualizations were your favorite part, were they the most difficult part to code as well? Or what did you like really struggle with when you were making this project? They were not. Actually, the most difficult part was just grasping the 4D thoughts <laughs> for the objects. So I think even though here it's written first in my essay, it was the hardest to grasp, just the eight neighbors. So how do you actually measure the fractal dimension? Because I was thinking of doing something with the cubes, right? But then, uh, just, just as a shout out to all the TAs at the Wolfram camp, they're amazing. They help you with, their, um, with your project. So a TA helped me figure out that, well, for 4D, it's, you, you don't have to, I didn't use the cubes in this case. I just use the actual 4D cellar automata. So you start from the center. It's not a cube, it's something else, but you, you can with a high confidence say it has eight neighbors. And then we had this very, it's kind of redundant, but you get the point. You count all eight neighbors, you check if they're alive or not. So yeah, X, Y, Z, and W axis. I think that was the hardest part of this project. Yeah, that's reasonable. Um... But your project has been absolutely amazing, um, especially since it's about 4D, but that's like very difficult to actually visualize. Um, so I'm like really impressed. That was amazing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, although I haven't been able to speak much due to some technical issues, I was listening to everything you said. And honestly, it's so impressive that you were able to do everything in two weeks. Thank you. I'm proud of this project too. As you should be, yeah. <laughs> So I guess transitioning a bit away from your project, uh, let's just hear your thoughts about the Wolfram language in total. Um, like if you've used other coding languages before, like Python and Java, for example, how do you think the Wolfram language compares with that? So I have actually worked with Java and Python before. I learned them before I learned the Wolfram language, but I would definitely say it's a lot easier to code with the Wolfram language. Um, it's has a ton of cool functions. And so functions that you can use to focus more if like you're working on a data analysis project, if you're trying to use something with AI. So they have these cool inbuilt functions so that you can focus more on your project rather than writing like the rules, the for loops, the if statements. I mean, if statements are needed, but just writing the, <laughs> just the, tools yeah for the um project so this yeah, is like the next yeah that's a really nice way of looking at the wolfram language it's very helpful when you're um it helps you just like do the project instead of worrying on worrying about creating the tools for it um yes exactly uh -huh. so i guess uh, how have you used it in your like previous projects uh, uh -huh. what do you want to do with it in the future just uh, what do you think the Wolfram language has inspired you to create? Yeah, I feel like you can do whatever you want in the Wolfram language without worrying too much about like its phys feasibility because I'm not sure the phrase, but 
you can bet that there's a function somewhere that will help you for your project. So another thing that's cool about the Wolfram language is that they have a function repository where people can just submit their own cool functions and then you can use them later in your project. So for example, if you want to play poker, there's something for that. If you want to see the messages on different um, Bitcoin, Ethereum transactions, you, there's a function for that too. So definitely. Can, um, I remember yeah. back when we were at camp, um, I think one of the TAs created created an UUFI function that just turned all your text um, into like UU language. Uh, so I guess <laughs> it just goes to show the absolute creativity that you have with the Wolfram language. Um, and then I guess bringing all of it together, what's something you want to do in the future with Wolfram? Uh, like what do you envision completing with this language and maybe even just with this project? Uh-huh. Um, yeah, as I was talking with you, I noticed there's a lot of future work that can be done. So with 4D spaces and analyzing the symmetry, for the future, I actually don't really have a specific project I'm interested in, in working on. So if you have an idea, I'd be happy to hear it. I know they have a ton of um, databases and entities. And so I think I'm interested in looking into those more just to see the data and if I can create, I mean, of course, you can obviously create something like a cool project for that. So I just wanted to do something with the, um, databases the Wolfram language has. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I guess that wraps up our first episode of the Wolfram Student Podcast. Thank you so much for coming, Yana. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for having me, Sam and Rushank. Absolutely. Um, we wish you the best of luck in college and your future endeavors, and hopefully we'll be seeing some more Wolfram projects coming out from you soon. Yeah, thank you. I definitely enjoyed making this podcast and with y'all and I'm, I'm looking forward to working on more projects definitely yeah. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Work from Student podcast. We hope you learned something new today and take away insights from today's discussion. If you want to be featured in a future episode, fill out the form at tinyurl.com slash WSP dash interest dash form. And finally, be sure to join us in two weeks' time when we discuss optimizing multi-layered neural networks on Boolean functions with Tay and Kim. And once again, thanks for watching.